If you've been listening to the remarks of the chief economist for the Bank of England, Andy Haldane, this week, you'd have learnt two things. You can't trust economists, and economists now regard post-Brexit Britain as a financial powerhouse unrivaled across the globe. It's funny how the anti-expertise Brexiteers don't mind when an expert says that, isn't it? It's also possibly interesting that our economy succeeding during the current set of trading conditions, the very ones we're abandoning by leaving the EU, is heralded as evidence of the positive consequences of Brexit, which hasn't even happened yet. But this week we've also had the flurry of controversy surrounding the UK ambassador to the EU, a man who until this week you have probably never heard of. Ivan Rogers, a titan of diplomacy who, if you're a Remainer, was the only man capable of speaking in Europe to anyone... But if you're a Brexiteer with some sort of malign, europhile, pseudo-Frenchman plotting to destroy Brexit. He certainly seems to have been vocal in his concerns about the Brexit process. And that's what I kind of want to talk to you about for the next hour. That securing a deal might take 10 years. That there are serious institutional concerns in Whitehall about how something as complex as this might be delivered. His farewell email was punchy by the standards of softly spoken mandarins he said this i hope you'll continue to challenge ill-founded arguments and muddled thinking that you will never be afraid to speak the truth to those in power i hope that you'll support each other in those difficult moments he's talking to his staff here where you have to deliver messages that are disagreeable to those who need to hear them you'll continue to challenge ill-founded arguments and muddled thinking the implication of that must be that the government is muddle-headed about brexit and needs to hear the honest opinions of skeptics and that feels right to me. People involved in the Brexit process shouldn't just be red, white and blue partisans of the Leave campaign, should they? In fact, civil servants should be neutral, should even be constructive critics, shouldn't they? And this, I'd love to hear your thoughts about how much faith you have in the process ahead. Not a debate about whether Brexit is good or bad. It's a debate about, it's a debate about confidence in how we're going to achieve it. Do you have that confidence? 0345 6060 973. And who do you want to see? batting for Brexit. Now, as you know, if you're a regular listener, I've just about voted Remain, but I'm not particularly dogmatic about its benefits. I see the arguments for Brexit, especially in terms of national sovereignty, but I'm terrified at the lack of planning that preceded the referendum. As Theresa May admitted on television today, I think we lack the expertise in negotiation to argue our case well. And I think our erstwhile European partners have no goodwill to make things easy. Indeed, will be motivated to make it hard for us. And I want to see neutral civil servants running the process. I want to see, gulp, experts. I don't want to see broad brush populists like Uncle Nigel Farage, now of course of this fine parish, parping about taking back control. I don't want to hear the inane platitudes of Theresa May about Brexit meaning Brexit. I want whoever is our best and brightest involved. I want us to be recruiting the best and brightest of every major company, every major institution here and abroad to put together a top-notch team of talents. And I don't care whether those talents subsist inside rabid Brexiteers or not. Indeed, here's a thought, it'll be better in the hands of people who are sceptical, who are calm, who wouldn't die in a ditch for the cause. But maybe I'm wrong. Do you want to see an ambassador clad solely in Union Jack undergarments, proudly singing God Save the Queen, legs splayed triumphantly before a quailing Johnny Foreigner? Does being pro-Brexit matter to you as a quality in our civil service team? 0345 Because I do worry about expertise. I really do. Norway's Prime Minister, Erna Solborg, said this this week. We do feel that sometimes when we are discussing with Britain that their speed is limited by the fact that it's such a long time since they have negotiated. I fear a very hard Brexit. A hard Brexit because we lack experience. Because we lack expertise. And we've just reduced the experience of our ambassador even further, the new ambassador is Tim Barra, former envoy to Moscow and a career diplomat. He may turn out to be a tough negotiator. Do we need to know his politics on Brexit, though? Does he need to be a believer? Is that important? And whether he is or he isn't, do you confident that whether you voted Brexit or Remain doesn't seem to matter to me now? We're going to have Brexit. But do you look at this process and think, I believe in them. I think they can do it. 
As you know, and with a due sense of irony, this is the hour of the expert on LBC, where we use the services of people who, unlike me, actually know what they're talking about. So to help us understand the role of ambassadors in the civil service in Brexit, the importance or otherwise of neutrality, the nuts and bolts of what needs to happen to get us to Article 50 and then beyond, I'm going to be joined by the former ambassador to Lebanon, Tom Fletcher. He was the foreign policy advisor to three prime ministers. His book, Naked Diplomacy, is about the struggles of diplomacy in the modern technological digital age. But I actually wonder whether the most significant challenge to diplomacy is no longer technology, but ideological division. The civil service, like everything else, is now seen through the polarising prism of Brexit. That can't be good, can it? So call, call with your ideas and questions, Tom. Find out how it really works. How does the negotiation process work? How does Whitehall deal with this type of situation? And then answer me this as well. Should civil servants have to swear an oath to red, white and blue Brexit before working on our behalf? Are we reduced to that? You're either with us or you're against us. And how much faith do you have? If you voted Brexit, or even if you didn't, but particularly if you did, do you look at this process and think, we're going to do this, we're going to get a Brexit that works? Or do you look at it and think, no one has a clue what they're talking about from the Prime Minister downwards? 0345 60 60973. Tom Fletcher joins me now. Tom, how are you doing? Hi, Steve. Very well indeed, thank you. Um, Good to be on. So let's, let's start with the... How important is it that civil servants like ambassadors are free from politics, are neutral? Well, I, you know, I just think it's utterly uh, essential, and it's been the bedrock, really, of how the civil service works in the UK. It doesn't work like that in many countries, and it's one of the things that gives us that continuity and strength as governments come and go, that you have a bunch of people who are experts, and we can use that word, um, and who are able to serve the government of the day. But if you, if you simply uh, demand some sort of loyalty test uh, and some sort of political test for the civil service at, at key moments like this, it's much, much harder for them to do their jobs. And do you think that's what's happened here, Tom? Do you think this is effectively that this is a guy who didn't really in his heart of hearts believe Brexit, didn't think it should happen, didn't think it could happen, thought that his political masters were incredibly naive and willful, uh, tried to have some hard conversations and was basically not, not getting anywhere? No, I mean, I think you could, you could sense a certain amount of frustration from the, um, the message uh, that Ivan Rogers sent uh, as he left. But this was someone who I, you know, I'm confident would have been going out there and negotiating incredibly hard uh, for, the, for the UK and for the best Brexit possible. I mean, actually... Ivan was known in the civil service as, as, as extremely tough on these issues. And so it's, it seems slightly ironic in a way that um, he's being depicted in parts of the media and parts of the political debate as some complete uh, kind of sheep in all, in all of this. Um, but is it fair to say, Tom, that if you don't... Can, can that, but let me re-pitch that. Can the ambassador to the EU responsible for negotiating Brexit do that if he voted Remain? Well, I don't know how he voted. No, no, I'm, not, um, I'm, I'm uh, not saying he did or he didn't, but I mean, we've got a new one there and no one knows presumably what he, what, what he voted. But I'm saying uh, as a theoretical question, can you be our ambassador yeah. if you believe in Remain? Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, it doesn't matter as a civil servant how you voted or what you believe. You are there to serve the government of the day. And when the government changes, then you serve a different government. You know, I worked in number 10 and I was working for Gordon Brown one day and the next day I was working for David Cameron. I didn't have to swear some sort of loyalty test to the Conservative manifesto at that stage any more than I had to swear a loyalty test to the Labour manifesto. You're there to, to get on and do the business on behalf of that government. And they're the ones who are elected. They're the ones who are chosen by the people. And our job as civil servants is to, is to deliver for them. But human beings don't work like that, do they? I mean, I just wonder whether that clearly is right in, in theory, but in practice, people are partisan and they have their own opinions. Do you think something like Brexit can be achieved with people who, throughout the process, are thinking, this is, oh God, this is not going to work. This was a bad idea. Or does that underestimate well, I, civil servants? I think it's the nature. I think it's the nature of civil servants that, in, in some ways, they are quite you know, they're Boy Scouts. They they will get on with it when when they are given clear direction and a clear strategy, then they will get on and deliver it. You know, it, with very very few exceptions. And if if you don't agree with the strategy, if you don't agree with the policy, then you resign. Uh, you know, but it, it's very rare for that to happen. Uh, you know, I had 20 years inside government. 
and watched civil servants work flat out for the government of the day, even if their personal views and beliefs didn't match that government's manifesto. Well, we're getting, what we'll get into, Tom, I'd love to talk to you about, the, 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 the question, is there clear guidance and direction? Is there a roadmap to Brexit and, and how will that work? And we'll, if, if you don't mind, we'll, we'll, we'll get into that a bit over the, the coming hour, because that seems to be the question. Sure. I'm not, it doesn't really matter in a sense whether Brexit was a good decision or a bad decision. It's the decision. The question is, can we as a country put together the right people, the right process with the right direction from the political masters? Who I've got to be honest, and you can tell me if you disagree with this now, doesn't look like Theresa May has clarity. It doesn't look like Liam Fox has clarity. But maybe I'm being too judgmental. Just as a quick judgment before we, we go to a break, Tom, do you think there is, there is that, that guidance coming from the top already? I'm pretty certain that it will, it will be in place by the time the negotiations start properly. There's a process now where everyone on our side, on the British side, is setting out their own negotiating positions and trying to influence where the UK strategy ends up. And so inevitably, there'll be churn and flux and you know, a bit of confusion as, as things fall into place. But by the time that Tim Barrow walks out into that negotiating room to start the negotiation, I'm confident that he'll know, he'll know what, the, what the plan is. Uh, Tom Fletcher is going to stick around. So ask him because he, he has been in the rooms where these things are debated and I, I'm interested in what happens in a negotiation and how it works. So you can call and ask him questions, 0345 606 And your opinion that, you, that I'm interested in is, do you have faith in the process? And do you insist that everyone concerned backs the horse of Brexit? Do you accept Tom's views on civil service neutrality? Do you accept this notion that they will serve whoever their masters are to do whatever their masters ask. And I kind of do. And I want experts. I want sceptics. Do you know what? I actually want an ambassador who is anti-Brexit because they will look at it with clarity. They will look at it with discernment because they won't be all aboard the red, white and blue brash bus, which everyone else is. So a sceptic is what we want, isn't it? Where do you stand? And how much faith do you have in the process? Because I feel I'm worried about it. But you might call him and say, you know what? This is dead straightforward. Let's just get going. And we'll talk to Tom about how practical that is. But I, maybe I should stop worrying about how complex this is. Are you confident? 0345 60 60 973 is the number to call. I'm Stig Abel. This is LBC. It's now 516. L this is LBC with Stig Abel. The question uh, I'm asking is how much confidence you have in the process of Brexit, not whether it's a good or bad decision, but how we're going to achieve it. And I'm joined for the next hour who will be able to answer your questions and keep me on the straight and narrow by Tom Fletcher. He's the former UK ambassador to Lebanon. He's a visiting professor at New York University, and he was a political advisor, uh, a diplomatic advisor to various prime ministers in this country. And I'm interested in what the negotiation will be like, how we expect to achieve it. Because my concern is it's too complex and we don't have the capacity. But someone's texted in 84850 to say, are you aware just how negative you are on Brexit? It's relentless and depressing. And someone else has said, how dare you claim that a Brexiteer would not be as sceptical or as effective as a Remainer would be? What am I implying? I'm just, I'm trying to act as a counterbalance to the slightly, it's kind of patriotic in a way, but this belief that something as complicated as all this can just happen. And if we say things like Brexit means Brexit and red, white and blue Brexit and Britain's open for business, those sort of platitudes carry weight and they don't feel like they do. And I think there is an inherent paradox here, which is between having a close trade relationship with Europe, the single market and control over immigration. It's one or the other. And to suggest that it's not seems to me to be untrue. But anyway, I'm going to come to Tom shortly and ask him how the process is going to work. But if you have questions on what it will look like, what are civil servants told? How does it work? Do call with those. And your opinion. Are you sitting here tonight confident that we have the capacity and the direction to get a creditable Brexit? And what does that look like? 0345 60 60 973 is the number to call. You can text 84850 or tweet at LBC. Norman from Rickmansworth has a view. Uh, Norman, how are you doing? I'm good. I'm good. Um, I do not believe that our leader has any intention whatsoever to deliver to the UK the uh, what is required to make to the country uh, join together, which is a reduction in immigration. And I say that for the following reason. Therefore, she has no intention, by the way, to do anything about Brexit. I say that for the following reason. She's had seven, eight months 
And in, in the last seven, eight months, 200,000 non-EU migrants have come into this country and there is no plan whatsoever, no Article 50 needed and nothing required to bring it down to the tens of thousands that she promised six years ago, I think it was, when she was Home Secretary. If she had taken that action, if she did take that action right now and say, this is how I am going to bring down non-EU migration to the tens of thousands, I think she would carry the whole country to a relief and an ability to give her the flexibility to go to the EU. It's a non-brainer if she could actually boast in the next few months, I've done one half the job, I'm going to now do the other half. I think that would allow us to say, OK, we can cope with more EU migration, but not while there's 300,000 unplugged. So you believe, therefore, she doesn't have clarity about what she wants to achieve? I think she's lying to us. I believe she is... She is. I mean, I heard... I don't know if you heard the... Um, the, the um, what's her name? The, the Today on Sky. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Sophie Ridge's interview today. Yeah, yes, that, that interview. She avoided the question several <coughs> times, and she kept talking about it like a jewel... There's these jewel paths, and there's not a single path. I think as far as most of the UK population is concerned there is one path that they want solved they want to see a solution to and that is the immigration problem and by that i do not mean the racist immigration problem i mean the lack of resources this country has to take the number of I, people coming into it i understand that norman tom here it's an interesting question this that, that, that norman's raising and i just wanted to get what would it be like in the civil service at the moment post brexit is it blind panic when they're asked to do something that is Complicated. I mean, I believe it's complicated and people are saying I'm being relentless and depressing. How complicated a piece of work for the civil service is the process of Brexit? I mean, well, just to pick up on, on, on Norman's point, first of all, I mean, I, I don't think that immigration itself was on the ballot paper on the 23rd of June. And I don't think that was what uh, many of those voting for Brexit were voting for. Um, so we have to be a, a bit careful here not to introduce everything else that people want to see uh, into, this, uh, into this debate. On, on the complexity of the thing, I mean, this is the hardest, toughest negotiation that any of the civil servants involved will have done you know, in our lifetimes, uh, you know, for at least a generation. It is really tough. And it's not just tough because of the complexity of the, the issues, but because now, because of social media, because of 24-7 media, because of all the scrutiny they're under, it's, you're doing a negotiation not just with the 26 other members of the European Union, but with your own population, your own media, your own parliament, all of whom have very different views of, of what they want you to achieve. Well, no that's my point. I mean, achieve one thing, other people want to achieve another thing. Well, that's what I find so fascinating about that, because that's why I get annoyed, and maybe people regard it as depressing, but I get annoyed when I see things like Brexit means Brexit, which is obviously a circular statement that means nothing. And for you, the civil service to do their job, they'll need to know with clarity what Brexit means, what the intention behind Brexit means. And are they going to get that? So, I mean, I, I liken this a bit to, uh, to the rumble in the jungle. And before the fight, Muhammad Ali didn't tell everyone that he was going to do the rope of dope And that was his tactic to win. He was going to exhaust George Foreman and then come out with a counterpunch in whatever round it was. He, he did set out his plan to win. And I think we have to try and divide strategy and tactics here. It's essential that the government sets out what its overall strategy is, its overall objectives. It's kind of the broad lines of, of its aspiration for the negotiation. But then it's, it's got to let the negotiators get on with delivering that, the, the best possible deal. But possible. That's, what, that's what I struggle we with. We can't do that if we're giving a running commentary the whole time. I know, but that, that's what I struggle with, because do we know what good Brexit looks like? Because she, Theresa May said today, anybody who looks at this question of free movement and trade as a sort of zero-sum game is approaching it in the wrong way, i.e. she thinks that we'll be able to negotiate the best of both worlds. But it seems to me, is it not inherent in the European project that to get the best of both, to get the best of trade, you have to have freedom of movement? It is a zero sum equation, isn't it? And my concern is, does she know? And therefore, can civil servants possibly know what good Brexit looks like? Well, I'd, I'd say you never know until the negotiation starts oh, what is really on the table. In, in my experience in Brussels, and I spend way more time in European councils than, um, than is good for anyone's sanity. Uh, and by the way, there, there are very few questions to which the answer is another European council. Uh, but in, in every single one of those councils, 
each of the countries there would, would build in negotiating fat, would build in leverage. They wouldn't reveal until they got into the room what their hand really was, where their red lines really were. And in some ways, one of the, the reasons for the government not getting a better deal with the European Union before the referendum was because they were being pressed to spell, set out in public too much of what they wanted. And so everyone they were negotiating with had a very clear idea of what they wanted. And it's, it, you know, it's, it's not the right way to, to enter a negotiation. We'll come back to that point. It's an interesting one there. Uh, Matthew's on the line from Heathrow. Matthew, what's your view? Yeah, well, um, my view is I'm a... Uh, we'll come back to you. We'll come back to you, Matthew, because we're, we're losing you. We'll have to get that back. Someone's actually, text, someone's actually texted in, uh, Tom, to say, why did the ex-ambassador advise Cameron to accept such rubbish negotiation EU terms for us to stay in the EU? How much of that is on Cameron and how much is on the negotiating team? Because I think a lot of us said at the time, and, and it's been proven even more accurate in hindsight, that unless you had something to say on immigration, you would never sell this deal to the British public. And lo and behold, it became the case. Was that negotiation bad negotiation by civil servants or bad direction from David Cameron, in your view? I, I, neither, actually. I think, you know, I, I saw close up how hard uh, David Cameron worked on securing that, the, the kind of air miles and time he, he racked up trying to get the right deal. But I also saw civil servants, including and probably especially, actually, um, Ivan Rogers in Brussels, absolutely going to the wire to get the best, um, the best deal possible, putting their bodies on the line, negotiating all night, hammering away at the detail of these very complex negotiations. I think one reality is, one political reality is, that whatever they brought back, there were going to be a significant number of people uh, in politics and outside who would say it's not enough. Yeah, that's, well, I, 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 we'll return to that because that's an interesting point. William is on the line from South Norwood. Hi, William. Hello. What's your view? I'd like to ask Professor Fletcher, please. Um, I'm generally interested in what leverage the British negotiating team will be able to exercise uh, in the uh, talks. And on, in particular, I've been reading uh, quite widely in the media that the EU, uh, Brussels in other words, is said to be fearful of a successful Brexit because that would be likely to in, at least encourage further uh, member states to head for the exit. But the, the paradox is that a punishment deal would make the EU look punishment deal for Britain would make the EU look rather as a addictive and pernicious outfit in some lights, and it would be harmful to European citizens, EU citizens, as well as to British people. Um, could that possibly be used as part of the? in uh, the UK's uh, approach. William, these are great questions. We're going to go to the news, but stay on the line and Tom will stay on the line. So I think that's a fantastic issue for us to get into. We always talk about this, don't we? There's levers to pull. The, we'll be able to, they, they need us more than we need them, etc., etc. It's, it's you're absolutely right. We should try and think of the specifics of it. And if Tom was being asked to be the negotiator, to be the civil servant, what levers would he feel he can pull? Well, he'll think about that over the news. You think about it as well with your thoughts, and we'll come back to it after this. And again, if you go to call, ask Tom. He's, he's, he's been around these things. He's seen the negotiators up close and personal at great cost to his mental well-being one suspects but ask him a question or give us your thoughts do you believe in the process 0345 60 60 973 is the numbers of call i'm stig able this is lbc it's 5 31 news time now with tim humphrey Egg able on lbc call 0345 60 60 973 very good afternoon to you here until six o'clock this sunday afternoon on LBC. And the question we're debating is, do we believe in the process that's going to get us to Brexit? Do we think that the civil servants have the direction from above? Are we concerned that their political views might intervene? And do we believe that effectively there is meaning to the notion of what Brexit means so that something is achievable? And William, uh, just as we went to the news, left this poser for Tom Fletcher, who joins us, who's the former UK ambassador to Lebanon, knows what he's talking about when it comes to negotiation. What levers do we have to pull in this negotiation. We keep talking about them as if they exist. So Tom Fletcher, he's right, isn't it? We need to, what are these levers? What what possible strings can we pull to say to the EU, you need us as much as we need you in this? Well, I think it's an excellent question um, uh, from William. I, I think you will hear more, particularly from the EU Commission in the run up to the negotiations, more of this quite aggressive language saying that we do have to hammer the UK. We've got to make an example of the Brits so that others don't follow them out of the door. Some of that is just, um, just pre-negotiation kind of bluster. 
in reality, the leverage is very different with each different country. There are countries in Scandinavia that, that really want to retain a UK voice in many of these big debates because they like that sort of hard-headed Northern European approach. The countries like Germany that are worried about uh, the increasing influence of Russia through Europe and a very uncertain neighbourhood in the Middle East Others, other countries that want to retain some measure of freedom of movement or certainly plenty of trade. And here, you know, with our fantastic creative industries, with all the other strengths that we have in our economy, we do have real levers. But I think one very big lever is that whatever you hear now from a lot of the Europeans and actually from some of our own side, uh, no one really thinks it's in their interest to have some horrible, messy, angry divorce. There is a need for all sides to get to clarity as quickly as possible. And I think that plays in our interest. William, before I ever think about that, what do you think about that? Well, it's a very enlightening reply from uh, Professor Fletcher, which I thank him for. I would just make two brief points. Um, there is a threatening and, and, and rather darkening geopolitical climate at the moment that's affecting the continent of Europe. And I think that really makes it imperative on the statesmen and women who are going to be dealing with this. Because I believe that the... Um, important member states will call the shots and that in effect the EU bureaucracy will be largely sidelined despite uh, appearances. It's imperative that the EU does not destabilise the UK in the current geopolitical situation. And I think one le lever that is widely touted in the press that we do have is the UK's contribution, defence contribution. And my, my, my final little point is that I think it would be counterproductive for... Uh, the negotiations to end up weakening the City of London as a finance centre too much because I think that would be detrimental to the, to the pan-European economy. Well, it would be detrimental to our economy, William, as well, because that's a lot of our well, tax, of course, tax yes, credit that, goes, that goes there. without saying, but I'm talking about it would rebound on Europe as well. Yeah, that's it. Uh, Tom, you make the point about the various different countries, but how much political capital is there in a country like Germany, for example, where the EU is central to its vision of itself and its place in the world. And actually, it doesn't want to encourage other countries to go uh, to leave the EU. So the, William called it sort of the punishment aspect of the deal. Germany will be quite strong on that, won't they? Because the better the deal is for Britain, the more Italy might wobble, the more France might wobble at a time when they could have a populist president in Le Pen, probably won't. Uh, there could be a populist leader in Holland, probably won't be, but it's possible. So there is going to be, have to be some sort of punishment handed out, isn't there? Well, I was, I was in Berlin um, a couple of months ago, and, you know, they clearly see this much bigger picture that, that William refers to, the, the, the darkening clouds uh, across Europe, the threat from Russia, the uncertainty in the Middle East. You know, one of the ironies of 2016 is that Chancellor Merkel has emerged as the, the main bastion now against fascism in Europe. And we all have to hope that she, uh, she continues to do the job she's doing, uh, holding, the, holding the line there. I, I don't think that when it comes down to it, the Germans are going to be in that sort of punishment mode. I don't think it's her style. She will be tough, absolutely tough. But they don't, uh, want, anyone, they don't, they don't want anyone else to go, though, do I mean, I'm interested about this because I've heard this argument, the one I'm making a lot, but maybe it's not true, um, that if it looks too good then leaving the EU becomes an attractive option for other countries, and that's the last thing that Merkel wants. I'm sure, I'm, I'm sure she'll be very pragmatic. She'll, be, she'll take it issue by issue. She'll approach the negotiations uh, in a very rational way uh, without huge amounts of emotion. You know, the, the very worst way to deal with um, a negotiator like uh, Angela Merkel is to charge in there wave, you know, waving a handbag around your head and singing the national anthem. Uh, you've got to get down to the substance and really understand her interests and, and the interests of the other people around the table as well. That's the only way to run a successful negotiation. And that, by the way, is why you need these, the embassies doing that work in advance of the negotiations. And it's why, by the way, there isn't absolute clarity on everything at this stage, because they've got to gather all that intelligence, gather all that knowledge and preparation in order to get the best possible Brexit. OK, we'll come back to that as well. Matthew's on the line from Heathrow. Matthew, uh, we've got a better line now, I think. How, how are you doing? Yeah, very good, thanks. Yeah, uh, well, what, I mean, I'm a Remainer, but except we've got to all work together to get um, the Brexit, uh, to get the best deal. But the triggering the Article 50 is just going to set off a two-year time bomb, and Europe is just not going to want to negotiate until right at the end, and they'll dictate the terms. And, I mean, I think... 
um, that really we've got to hold off, wait to see what's happening in Europe, and uh, we've got to get everyone from the Brexit side and the Remain side to work together, and we've got to put some bad cops there. I was for Nigel Farage to be the ambassador, and obviously, you know... <laughs> he's got, he's got another job now, actually, Matthew. He's working for LBC. He can't be honest. Yeah, I see that. He got a better job. He got a better offer. <laughs> Uh, that's a great point, this Tom. Uh, 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 before we start talking about the career prospects of Nigel Farage, which I suspect is not going to be great for my career prospects uh, here at LBC, is this um, triggering Article Fifty? How much is Theresa May says she's going to do it? But Matthew's point is that sets us on a two-year collision course. Is that a bad negotiation tactic in your view? Well, there isn't much choice. I mean, it has to be triggered at some point. The, the starting gun has to be fired. Uh, one advantage we have is that, that that choice rests with us, but it's, a, it's not a great secret as to when, it, uh, when it's going to start to happen. But Matthew makes a really important point here, which is that the dynamic of any negotiation is that the final compromise, the final package doesn't really emerge until right near the end. That's when, that's when you really see into your opponent's eyes and understand what they have to hold on to and what they can concede. So th- this won't just simply be sort it out within six months and then we can all go home. It will go right to the wire. And is that... Often, by the way, negotiations go beyond the wire. You set a deadline and then you have set another deadline. You know, George Mitchell says negotiations are 700 days of failure and then one day of success. Well, that's, a, that's, that's an optimistic view, view of it, uh, I, I suppose. So do you think this can be done in that sense, that you can have, uh, have Article 50 triggered in, in March and then there'll be a two-year race to get something done, but that's all achieved in that period? knowing the amount of work that has to be done. Because someone's tweeted in uh, saying, we require lots of decent pen pushers to thrash through huge amounts of mundane detail. Opinion on Brexit is irrelevant. It's just hard work that's needed. The suggestion being that this is just a, a logistical problem for the civil service to achieve rather than anything else. Well, I think you do have to put huge numbers of your best people on the job. Um, you know, it's a, a little bit like recruiting for Bletchley Park in the Second World War. You've got to have your smartest people sat in that dungeon really working this stuff through. But one thing I would say is, as, as a West Ham fan, it, it really helps if people then just get behind the team. Yeah. Uh, you know, I've, I've been at so many West Ham games when you know, everyone's saying, take him off, put him back on, you know, put it down the left, put it down the right, and, and very quickly start booing their own team. At some stage, we do just need to give our people uh, the space to deliver the best deal they can get. Do you think I should cheer up a bit about this, Tom? Is that what you're saying? Shall I, shall I just be, just, this, this will all work out fine in the end? I, I wouldn't dream of giving you any advice uh, on your emotional state, Stig. I think you, you seem to be doing okay to me. All right. Uh, but, but, but we have to kind of rally together. That's a fair point. Um, uh, we'll take more of your calls uh, for the last 15 minutes of the show. Tom Fletcher's going to stick around. And, that, and he, as I say, he knows what it's going to be like. And I'm interested in some point I'll be pointing to him in the last quarter of an hour is he talks about the various different countries. How will their views be represented in the negotiation? I think it's really interesting that... We, we, are we negotiating with one monolithic institution or an institution with many different views and how will that work? But if you've got questions, you've got thoughts on this, are you confident? Tom is slowly convincing me. Am I going to no longer be an arch snowflake Ramona here and just start thinking this is going to work? This is going to be fine. Tom seems quite confident. He knows what he's talking about. Lots of you guys believe you believe in Britain. You believe in Brexit. Maybe I should stop worrying. Do you agree? 03456 to continue cheering me up about this. It's 546 here on LBC. Uh, Tom Fletcher, the former UK ambassador to Lebanon, has been with us this hour, giving his expert opinion on how the negotiation will work. And the question I'm asking is, do you feel confidence in it? I'm just starting to begin to feel the first tremors that it won't be as bad as well. Because in my mind, it's too complicated, this Brexit process. And it was a binary decision whose outcome is on a spectrum. And therefore, you're handing over to, to, to civil servants, to the Brexit team, an awful lot of variables at a time when Europe has it in its own interest to keep us from getting a good deal. That's how I analysed it. And whether you agree, do you think this is just me picking holes in something? Or actually, there's, there's reason to be confident. But I do come back to this notion, binary decision of Brexit, yes or no? We said yes. The outcome, the negotiation, what it means in terms of trade, what it means in terms of immigration is on a spectrum. It is something that then has to be negotiated. And that makes it very difficult. And I worry about our ability to do it. 
but maybe you feel confident and maybe I'm, I should start to be a little bit more positive. People certainly think so on texting 84850. The enemy within, people like you, that's me, talk down Britain and make a hard negotiation worse, almost like you are with the EU against us. Well, I'm not, actually, but maybe just blind British faith and confidence would be good enough to get us there. 03456060973. Alan's on the line from Shropshire. Hi, Alan. Hello, Stig. Hello. Uh, what's, um, what, what do you think? Well, what I'd like to say is we seem to have in this country this arrogant attitude that we're just going to negotiate and get what we want. At the end of the day, there's 27 other countries that will say under what terms we will be trading with Europe. We've got to, we seem to forget that 80% of our economy is a service industry, which is in banking, insurance, etc., etc., where we rely on the city, relies on getting into Europe. If we lose our license to trade in euros in Europe, we're in trouble. We've also got a car industry, remember, that is... Uh, you've got Nissan, which is Japanese. You've got Honda, which is Japanese. You've got Jaguar Rover, which is owned by the Indians. They're not going to bother whether they, <clears throat> if they have to pay a levy, whether they move to Europe or not. You could have the farming industry. You get, get um, you know, they, they get, you know, the, the subsidy from Europe. So what's your point? The point is that we have no power here. Five percent slapped on them. Will anything lose their subsidy and get thirty-five percent slapped on them? So you saying that we need Europe so much it's very hard to negotiate? Yes, we do need Europe. We, we've got problems. We've, we've got over 2 million people that live in Europe at the moment. I've got a niece that lives in Spain. You've got to say they get their pensions at the moment. They get medical care. Yeah. You know, at the end of the day, they're the property they own there. What happens if they die? Can yeah. they leave it to their siblings? Alan, it's a great, great, it's, yeah, it's a great question, uh, Tom. How much power do we have in these? I mean, Alan's phrased it because my concern is that we're so desperate for the financial services industry to remain in London because it gives us so much tax return. We're going to do a deal that supports that. We're so desperate for political reasons that Sunderland doesn't become a Detroit-style wasted city. So we'll have to do a deal to keep Nissan there. Do you not think that the EU will be looking at us going, they'll do lots of individual deals, they'll spend government, government money because otherwise, politically, they'll be in massive trouble? How much power do we have in these negotiations, do you think? Well, we do have power, um, but I think at, at some stage we will have to rank uh, our objectives and work out what are our absolutely essential red lines. And that probably won't happen until uh, we're close in, closing in on the end game. I mean, I think in the meantime, I mean, Alan, Alan reminded me that actually the whole world is watching this. It's not just about the Europeans and how we negotiate with them. It's about what everyone else thinks about Britain. As, in a way, it's about how we do the negotiation as well as what we negotiate. And we've got to be really careful, therefore, to, to project a confidence in, in the strength we have and to avoid this kind of circular firing squad that we, we have a tendency to get into in the UK at the moment, where everyone, the media, the politicians, the banks, the public, is basically just firing at each other. And you have this loss of trust uh, in any institutions. We've got to really focus on what our core strengths are, try and restore a bit of trust uh, in public life, and then just get on and get the best possible deal out there. You know, many people like Alan do think that the negotiators have been dealt a hospital pass. You know, I guess many of those, the 48%, believe that. But the reality is we are where we are, and uh, we've, we've got to make the best of it. Uh, Speem is on the line from Fulham. Speem, how are you doing? I'm doing fine, Steve. Hello, Tom. Hello. Uh, Go on. Yes, very interesting debate uh, about Brexit. And I, I had my own thoughts about this. I'm an EU citizen, and I've um, come to the UK six years ago. Um, and I understand people like me are kind of the one of the bargaining chips that, that the UK has in the Brexit deal. Um, so this leaves us basically with two options. Either go back to our country or... Um, Take, take up the British, uh, British citizenship for those of us who can. Um, however, for, my, for myself, I've decided I'm most probably leaving. But I've also considered an option, and I wanted to find out from Tom and you what you think of it. I've offered myself 
uh, as a member of the UK negotiating team. And I have a stake, obviously, in the matter. I have government experience, I have EU experience, but um, nobody took that offer up. So it's a good idea. This, <laughs> it's a good is idea. It's an option. Well, here's a question, Tom. It's a great point by Sabima, because um, someone said to me the other day, uh, what we should be doing is we should be going in to talk to the smartest people in the smartest organisations and saying, can we borrow your person for a year? Can we get someone like Sabima? Can we go around to Apple and say, can we have your best person? We'll pay you. Can we can we put together a crack squad of people to do this out of you know a ministry of all the talents? Is that a, is that a viable option, do you think? I very much, I really hope so. Um, and a lot of people have talked about, the, about whether or not there is enough uh, breadth of talent in the civil service. Clearly, much of the civil service has been trained for a different job than the one it's now been given. Yeah, uh, we've not had any get, we had to negotiate a trade deal for 33 years, have we? Yeah. I mean, we've got utterly brilliant people, and particularly those working on the negotiations in London and in Brussels. But it won't be enough. And so I really hope that government at various moments does go outside and says, right, we need, we need help on the legal side. We need help on X and Y and brings in the best possible people. You know, I made the analogy with Bletchley Park earlier on. You know, in the Second World War, we didn't just sit there and just, no. and just say, right, just for the existing officials to get on with winning this. We had a genuine national uh, effort. But I just think just one, just one point on what we just said. It, it's, another, it's a reminder that there's a real human dimension to this. Yeah. And it's very easy for, for people like us, maybe, and officials to talk about it in quite abstract terms, in, in terms of we're going to bargain this, we're going to give this, we're going to take that. But there's a, you know, it, it's very sad when you, when you hear people talk about themselves feeling like they're negotiating chips, bargaining chips, and we have to bear that in mind, I think. It is very sad. It's a very good point that Tom. Uh, do you know what I'm fr- um, frightened of, though, Tom, is that instead of getting a ministry of all the talents, they'll just chuck millions and millions of pounds on management consultants. And so what the Brexit will mean is the enrichment of one of the big four accountancy firms, one of the big magic circle legal firms. And that, you won't get anything other than that. That's what it will become. It'll become management consultant heaven. I, I mean, we have a pretty sceptical and um, effective uh, media, and I think they would be you know, on top of that. They'd be pretty vigilant. I've already seen it in the FT. I think it is happening. I think there is a there is a a budget to spend money on management consultants. I think it's going to happen. Well, let's see. Let's um, uh, we'll take a bet on it. I'll, I'll come back on in two years' time and, and we'll see whether they've recruited the right people or not. Uh, okay, we have to go shortly, uh, Tom. But before I do, someone just said they'd love to know uh, what sort. Give us. Can you give one example of a sort of nitty gritty negotiation? One point that could be negotiated where we say one thing and they want something else. What's the sort of level of detail would it get into? I mean, it will get into a level of detail we can barely imagine. I mean, we'll, it, when you look at the, the months it takes to negotiate a fishing quota, for example, I mean, these are, uh, these are very, very complex negotiations. And uh, it, it w- won't be easy. And there'll be times when it'll be very ugly and very messy. Uh, and we'll have to, it's why we have to stay so focused on our overall strategic objectives. And come, I come back to this point again, that at some point we'll have to rank our our top ambitions for negotiation. And at that point, bits of the media, bits of the political debate can't just say, we've got to get everything, uh, because it will simply be impossible. And we'll need to be realistic. Tom, thank you so much indeed. Uh, Stuart has texted in just to say, hello, Stig, you have to admit that if our civil service team are half as professional, focused and articulate as Tom, we stand a very good chance. Uh, and I kind of agree with that, Tom. Thank you so much for, for, for giving us your expertise. See, we believe in expertise at LBC in this hour. We don't, like Michael Gove, shun it. And it's nice to have someone who knows what they're talking about. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks, Dick. It's a pleasure. Um, yeah, that's Tom Fletcher. We'll continue to debate this for the rest of our lives, it feels like. But it is important. that, And, and maybe I'll stop being so negative. How's that for a New Year resolution to you all? I'll stop being negative. Maybe that will be all right. Do you think we'll be all right? Maybe we will. That's it for today on that happy note. I'm off now not to get a tube. <sighs> Don't forget you can listen to LBC whenever and wherever you want by downloading the LBC app. And if you missed any of today's show, there's the LBC podcast app too, available on iPhones and Android, iPhones and Androids. Leading Britain's conversation from nine, it's Steve Allen with Tom Daly in conversation. But first, here's Clive Paul.